Good morning once again. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 14. Now if you're new with us at Calvary here, we are studying the book of 1 Samuel here on Sunday mornings. And in our last study we saw how that the Philistines had come out to battle against Israel. We also saw how that King Saul was paralyzed by his circumstances, that he was sitting under a fig tree, or excuse me, a pomegranate tree, doing nothing while the enemy continued to increase in strength. His soldiers were terrified. Many of them had deserted. They were hiding in caves, pits, behind rocks. Some had even joined the Philistines. And while Paul, well, Saul just sat there doing nothing really, a kind of a useless excuse for a leader. Jonathan, unlike his father, was a man of faith. And as a man of faith, he looked at the situation through the eyes of faith. And as he looked at the situation through the eyes of faith, he said, you know, God doesn't need a whole army to get victory. He can do it through one or two guys if he wants to. And that led him to make a bold proposal to his armor bearer. We pick it up in verse 6. And Jonathan said to his young, the young man who bore his armor, Come. Let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. So Jonathan proposed a venture in faith. He said, look, you know, why don't we see if God wants to do a work? Why just sit here doing nothing? Let's go over and maybe God wants to work a miracle. Maybe he wants to deliver Israel, into, excuse me, deliver the Philistines into our hands. So after they confirmed that God was in it, they uh, quickly climbed up the bluff where the Philistines were kind of encamped uh, on the mesa above, and they jumped into the camp of the Philistines and began to cut them down, about 20 guys in the space of a half acre. Well, Saul was encamped with his little army, those that were still with him, across the valley, and of course they're looking in this confusion, it looks like, in the Philistine camp. Now, we read as God began to use Jonathan and his armor bearer, suddenly he strikes the Philistines with the confusion. They begin to strike each other. He brings a great earthquake. Philistines are running everywhere, okay? And Saul and his men see that this vast number of the enemy is beginning to dwindle. He's like, what's going on? Take a roll, see who's missing. Sure enough, Jonathan and his armor bearer were missing. So Saul decides to join the battle. Now he's a little late, all right? God's already at work. God's spirit is already giving victory. The enemy's on the run. But as so often is the case, when the spirit is moving and the enemy is fleeing, some leader, like Saul, decides to impose some stupid rule that sounds spiritual, but it's just rooted in pride. So Saul decides he's going to make this oath. Verse 24. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. Now, he should have just left it alone. God was working. God was giving victory. But no, Saul figures, you know, I'm going to make an oath, you know, and we'll finish this job and get the Philistines defeated and so on. Remember what um, Solomon said in Proverbs 29, verse 20? He said, do you see a man hasty in his words? <laughs> There's more hope for a fool than for him. That kind of summed up Saul's life. In fact, if we had to pick one verse from the New Testament that I think best sums up this story, it would probably be Galatians 3, verse 3, where Paul said to the Galatians, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now going to be made perfect in the flesh? Of course, the Galatians had gotten into legalism. Some teachers had come to town saying, look, you know, that's all well and fine that you believe in Jesus, but that only gets your foot in the door. You've got to then do all these works, get circumcised, keep the law of Moses, and that way you will finish the work uh, God began. Paul says, are you crazy? God doesn't need your help to do anything. You think that by you adding your fleshly works to what God's Spirit is doing, that's going to somehow make God's work more complete? In essence, this is what Saul was doing. God was working. God was giving victory. And suddenly Saul imposed a legalistic rule 
whereby he was going to help God finish the work he had begun. You know, I've been a Calvary pastor now for 35 years. And I wasn't there at the very beginning, but you better believe I have studied the history of Calvary Chapel carefully. I've read books. I've talked to people. I've seen, uh, I've seen DVDs. I know that this movement was a total work of God. Pastor Chuck pastored for 17 years, churches that never got above 100 people. And all of a sudden, he finds himself in the midst of some kind of a work of God that nobody knows what's going on. All they know is that young people are coming, and they're coming in droves. The hippies who were, you know, on drugs, who were given over to these communal situations where they're having sex and drugs are flowing and so on. And all of a sudden, God begins to touch these kids. And they begin to come. And quickly, Calvary, they, they outgrew the facility they had, which wasn't a very big church. And so while they're building a new facility, they purchased a circus tent and began to fill with chairs. Every service, more people started coming. Every service, they were putting up more chairs. Finally, one Saturday night, as they you know, got the, the tent you know, wired up for an even bigger crowd, and, and Chuck looks over the, uh, from the stage at a sea of folding chairs, 1,600 folding chairs. He looks at his young son, Chuck Jr., and says, how, do you th how long do you think it'll take God to fill up this place? And uh, actually, it was young, young Chuck Jr. who said that to his dad. How long do you think, Dad, it'll take God to fill up this place? Chuck said, about 12 hours. That next day, every seat was taken. People were standing. And after the service, Chuck looked at his son and said, Son, this is a total work of God's grace. There's no way I can take any credit for what God is doing here. It's a total work of of God's grace. We have to understand this, guys. We don't, God doesn't need our help to finish the work he has started. Beware of falling into legalism. Listen to me. Beware of falling into legalism. It will halt the work of the Spirit in your life and turn God's victory into defeat. But it's dangerous. It's subtle. You know why? Because legalism sounds so spiritual. It kind of goes like this. And it happens with young Christians primarily, but none of us are immune. Where God is working, okay, I've seen it with young believers, God's working, and he's delivering them from the drugs, the alcohol, whatever else they've been in bondage to. And they're so excited about what God's doing, they're so thankful that they begin to do something that, you know, they don't mean to do anything wrong. But God is blessing, God is working, God's grace is upon them, so they say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read my Bible even more. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to fast more. I'm going to go to church more. People say, well, what's wrong with that? That sounds spiritual to me. Look, there are all kinds of blessings and benefits that will come to a person who reads the Bible more and prays more and does any one of a number of spiritual devotions more as long as the motive is, I just want to draw close to God. If that's your motive, God will bless it. But if your motive is, well, I'm going to do these things because I'm going to help God finish the work he started in my life, now you've fallen into the trap of the devil. Because the devil knows, the devil knows that the quickest way to torpedo the victory God is giving you in your life is to make you think you have to help God finish it. Move over, Lord. Okay? Well, you're start, you started a good work, but step aside now. We'll, we'll finish this together. God says, oh, Really? I won't share my glory with another. You know, about three years ago, I was at a pastor's conference out in California, Calvary Conference. And one of our Calvary pastors, his name is Dave, good guy. I know Dave personally. He's a good man. But he shared a story, and so because he shared it publicly, it's not a confidential thing. But Dave has been used by God uh, in an incredible way. Dave's church has got to be 12, 13,000 people. And one day, a professor at one of the Christian colleges uh, in the area asked Dave if he could meet him for lunch at the university, okay, at the Bible college there, to talk about the secret of the success that God was doing in Dave's church. Well, Dave happened to be reading a book at this time, some kind of a church growth book, where the author outlined a bunch of principles for making a church grow. And for some reason, Dave embraced those and thought, well, I'll share these with the professor. So they're standing in line in the cafeteria. They get their food, put it down on the table. And um, 
Dave is just about ready to share these principles from this book as to how God made his church so great, so big. And just before he starts to speak, the professor says, you know, hang on a second, Dave. I need to get something to drink. So while he went over to get some milk or some water or something, the Holy Spirit spoke to Dave. He said so clearly, it was incredible. The Holy Spirit said, if you take credit for what I have done in this church by giving principles from a book, I will remove my Holy Spirit from this church. It was pretty powerful. When the, when the professor came back, he said, okay, Dave, what's the secret of your success? It is a total work of God's grace. Good answer. Good answer. Look at guys, legalism, which is what Paul, uh, Paul, I keep calling him Paul. Uh, you know, he was Saul before he was Paul, so I get confused. Anyways, legalism, which is what Saul, King Saul, was guilty of imposing on his soldiers, is always rooted in pride. Oh, we, 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 we don't think of it that way. We just think we're being real committed to the Lord. But legalism is always rooted in pride. Look at what Saul said in verse 24 again. He said, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. <laughs> Whose battle was this? Was it God's or was it Saul's? All of a sudden Saul is fighting not for God's glory, but for his own. You know, we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He became our commanding officer. We were enlisted into his army to fight his battles. Listen, his battles, not ours. Sometimes we lose sight of that. Sometimes we lose sight of that. We forget that he's in charge of us. We're not in charge of him. And whenever we lose sight of that and begin to think, you know what? He's fighting on my team, my cause, or my battles. We will try to then enlist the Lord to fight for me against my enemies whoever they are at that time. Could be my own spouse, okay? A lot of Christian wives not happy with their husbands. Lord, get him. Get him. You're with me, aren't you? You're on my side in this. He's, he's wrong. Get him, Lord. A lot of husbands do that to their wives. A lot of Christians say to the Lord, Lord, you know that brother or sister in church, they're not treating me right now. Lord, will you do something about that? Will you fight for me in this? Take my side, Lord. I'm right. Guys, listen. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spirits in the uh, demon, uh, demons, I should say, demons in the spirit realm. Those are, that's the fight we're fighting. Not with people. But so often we fall into this. I think of Joshua on the eve of the Battle of Jericho. Now, when God brought his people into the promised land, he had Joshua lead them in. And the first city he brought them up against was Jericho, which happened to be the strongest stronghold of the enemy in Canaan. And so on the eve of this all-important battle, the first battle in the promised land, Joshua had some pretty big sandals to fill. Moses had been the leader. God didn't let Moses bring the children of Israel into the promised land because he misrepresented God at the waters of Meribah. You know the story. So now Joshua's in charge. A lot pressing down on his shoulders. So you know how it is when you're on the eve of something very important? You often take a walk, don't you, just to kind of think on things. And so I, uh, Joshua was out taking a walk. And I imagine, you know how it goes, you're just looking down, thinking, probably kicking rocks, just kind of thinking about the battle. When all of a sudden he looks up and sees a stranger standing about maybe 25, 30 feet in front of him with his sword drawn. Joshua does not recognize this soldier. And so it says in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13, it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him. Again, he didn't know who this man was. He didn't recognize him as one of his soldiers. And so he asked him a simple question, a question about loyalty. Whose side was he on? He asked, are you for us or are you against us? That's a legitimate question, right? Are you for us or are you against us? And this stranger answered, no. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. If you notice, he didn't really answer the question, did he? 
The question was, are you for a stranger or are you against us? What does the stranger say? No. No. <laughs> now we know from the account that this was none other, none other than the Lord Jesus Christ who had made an Old Testament appearance. He is the, the uh, commander of the Lord's army. And he had come to fight for Joshua and Israel against the Philistines. So you say, well then, if it was the Lord, why didn't he just say, well, when Joshua said, are you for us or against us? Why did you say, well, for you, of course. I'm for you, Joshua, and Israel. Instead, he brushes the question aside by answering no. Now look, we all know that Jesus was for Joshua and Israel in their battle against Jericho. Even as the Lord is for us in our battles. Didn't Paul say this? And I got it right that time. It is Paul. In Romans 8.31, since God is for us, who can be against us? So then, if the Lord is always for his people, why didn't the Lord Jesus simply answer the question directly? Why did he seem to step to sidestep it? Listen, the Lord didn't answer the question because the question was fundamentally flawed. You see, Joshua was asking it from a position of authority, as a commanding officer, asking the Lord of glory, look, are you for us or against us? Because if you're for us, get in line behind me. That wasn't his place to say that to Jesus. Now he finally figured out who it was and he got behind the Lord. Right thing to do. But initially, he tries to enlist the Lord in his cause. To fight in his battle. Look guys, the battle belongs to who? The Lord. We are to line up behind him. We are his soldiers. He is our commanding officer. And listen to me. When it comes to God's loyalty toward us, that is never, ever in question. The real issue is not whether or not he is for or against us. The real issue is, are we for or against him? You say, what are you talking about? I'm always for the Lord. Really? Really? Sometimes we say we're for the Lord. But what we really mean is, no, I want God to be for me. And there's a lot of Christians who have turned against the Lord because he has not led their lives the way they have wanted him to. They have not done what they have wanted him to do in their lives. And so they're not really following him. They want him to follow after them, to bless what they want to do, to give them all the things that they want in life. Things that often go directly against what he may want for our lives. That's why he is quiet so often. That's why he doesn't answer our prayers so many times. Because we're praying amiss. We want to consume it upon our own lust, James says. And that's why the Lord doesn't answer us. The issue is not, Lord, are you for me? I mean, so often we make our little plans and we plan out our little strategies, don't we? And then we pray. Just like Saul did, by the way. He prayed after the fact. But we pray. Now, Lord, you see what's going on here. Now, I need you to fight for me, okay? Are you on my side? I need you on my team, Lord. Now, come on, get behind me. Let's go do this together. And what I'm actually planning goes against what God wants for my life. And so often when the Lord doesn't respond, doesn't help, doesn't give the person what they want, they turn against him. Because they're not really for him. They want him to be for them. The real issue, guys, is who is leading who? Who is leading who? Who is subservient to whom? Who is in charge? Is it us or the Lord? Of course, we know it's Jesus. We know that in theory. But not always in practice. Look, he is the commanding officer. He's the Lord of glory. He doesn't, be, he doesn't follow behind us blessing what we want to do and where we want to go and how we want to live our lives. When we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, our life as we have known it and lived it, guys, is now over. And we have become the slaves of Christ. Again, Jesus doesn't come alongside you and me to be our servant. To help us fulfill our dreams, bless our desires, he takes over. He takes over. He doesn't want you to add him to your life. He wants to become your life. A lot of Christians don't seem to understand that today. Remember what Jesus said in Luke 6 to a group of would-be disciples? 
He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet don't do the things that I tell you? He said, you know, I'm not really your Lord if you're not following me. If you're not obeying where I'm leading, if you're not going where I'm going, if you're not fighting my battles the way I want them fought against the enemy, then you know what? You may call me Lord, but I'm really not your Lord. Because a Lord is somebody who has control over your life. He's in control. Jesus Christ is our Lord if we submit our lives to him to lead us, to guide us, etc. Now, as we see in our text this morning, King Saul's pride got the best of him. And he made a foolish oath. And it brought with it some unintended consequences. First of all, it weakened his troops. Verse 25. Now all the people of the land came to a forest, and there was honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was the honey dripping. But no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Therefore he stretched out the end of his rod, his staff, that was in his hand, and he dipped it in the honeycomb and put it, his hand to his mouth, and his countenance bright, uh, brightened. He was infused with a, a surge of energy. Then one of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. They were weak. But Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance is brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. Look, no military commander worth his salt would deprive his troops of food while they were fighting the enemy. And this goes for a pastor who is leading his people in battle against the devil and his demons. Look, guys, I, I believe the honey represents the word of God. Remember what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, 103, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. The Bible is often likened to honey. And I believe that the point of the story, in a spiritual sense, is that Saul had deprived his people of food. In this case, honey, which would have strengthened the soldiers and allowed them to fight with everything they had. You know, the sad reality today is we see the same thing going on. It's not that churches and pastors have forbidden their people from reading the Bible. I mean, not like it was a few centuries ago where, and I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church, but the Roman Catholic Church actually forbid people from reading the Bible. And those that tried to translate it from Latin into the common tongue were taken by the church and burned at the stake. We've gotten past that. But there's a lot of pastors and churches, although they wouldn't say to their people, don't read the Bible, the way they respond to the Bible, the way they talk about it, they put it down like it's old news. Like it hasn't got the power to do anything. In a sense, they're telling their people, don't bother reading it. And what are they doing in its place? Well, they're giving their church, their people, the wisdom of men. The wisdom in the words of men in the form of pop psychology, other high-sounding philosophies, the very thing Paul warned us against in Colossians 2, verses 8 to 10. Don't let anybody cheat you with high-sounding words and great-sounding philosophies which, which look like they have wisdom attached to them, but they're just of the world. You know, you're people of God. You feed on the Word of God. Your relationship with Jesus is all you need to have everything you need to win this war for Him. God, Guys, only God's Word has the power to transform a life and give victory over the enemy. But again, sadly, far too many churches have rejected this idea today as foolish, archaic, and naive. Choosing rather to feed their people all kinds of other things. A big one today is mysticism in the form of contemplative prayer or spiritual formation, which is nothing more than Christianized transcendental meditation. We see other churches that are focused primarily on materialism through the word of faith teaching. How you can you know, claim your Cadillacs and your big houses by knowing verbal formulas and speaking it out and, and positively confessing your wealth and so on. Mysticism, materialism. Environmentalism is a big one. Some churches are consumed with the environment. Everything, the churches are going green, okay? As if God commanded us to save the planet when he said, save the people on the planet. 
And we see many churches today involved with social justice, which is just Christianized socialism. And that's just to name a few of the themes that dominate many pulpits across our country today. No wonder the weak church is weak and ineffective today, much like Saul's soldiers were weak when they couldn't eat. But Saul's foolish oath not only weakened his soldiers, it also hindered his troops from gaining a complete victory. Again, verse 29, Jonathan says, Look how my countenance is brightened, because I tasted a little of this honey. Verse 30, how much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies, which they found. For now they would have not, excuse me, for now would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. Guys, look, we're not called to slaughter anybody. Okay, we're called to defeat the devil and his demons in people's lives. But I'm sorry to say that for the most part, the church isn't having complete victory over the world. In fact, the church is compromising with the world. A prime example of that is how many churches uh, support gay marriage. I've heard different people tell me that as they're driving around, they're seeing uh, a good number of churches that have the rainbow flag out in front. On the marquee, all are welcome. In their minds, this is how you reach the world. You compromise what God has said, and you partner with the world. You embrace the world's sin and make them feel like it's okay. God loves you. Look, if you really love sinners, you want to tell them the truth. You don't encourage them to, to hang on to their sins in the name of some misguided attempt to bring them to Jesus. Look, revival always happens. When church leaders preach the whole counsel of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And if they don't, as we're seeing today, well, the church will continue to be defeated and society will continue to decline. Before I came here this morning, I checked with the, you know, the news and I read a Christian news service. And they always have some devotionals placed you know, within the news of the day. And one was about Charles Finney. Charles Finney was a great revivalist who was used mightily by God to help to help a spear uh, to um, help bring about the first great awakening in the early 1700s. But Charles Finney was a great revivalist. Listen to what he said about this subject. He said, "Listen, if immorality prevails in the land, the fault is ours in a great degree. If there is a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it." If the press, public press lacks moral discrimination, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in religion, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government, government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. Let us not ignore this fact, dear brethren, but let us lay it to our heart and be thoroughly awake to our responsibility in respect to the morals of this nation, end quote. And the whole article went on to say the only way we are going to be the moral conscience of this country is if pastors from pulpits preach the whole counsel of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Look, when Christians are fed a steady diet of God's word, the result is a strong church. And a strong church will go into the world and take territory away from the devil for the glory of God. A weak church can't do that. A watered-down church can't do that. A sick church can't do it. And that's what we're getting to lastly here. Saul's foolish oath had another unintended consequence. It created in his soldiers an abnormal craving for food. When God's people are starving spiritually, because they're not being fed the word of God, they will begin to devour foods that are forbidden and defiled. Look at verse 31. Now they had driven back the Philistines that day from Michmash to Agilon, so the people were very faint. And the people rushed on the spoil and took sheep, oxen, and calves and slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. Now, when the sun set... A new day began. The Jews were on a lunar calendar. 
So when the sun set, the new day began. And this new day now having begun, they were no longer under or bound by Saul's curse. Look at verse 24 again. He said, cursed is the man who eats any food until what? Evening. Because that would be the end of the day. What he was saying is, cursed is the man who eats any food all day today. Now, of course, when the sun went down, the people were so hungry, they began to take the animals, kill them right there on the ground. I would imagine they started barbecuing them, you know. Uh, I don't think they were eating them raw. But I know what they were doing is they, they had not bled the animals. They were cooking and eating the animals with the blood. Now, God had forbidden that in his law. The life is in the blood, God said. I'm the giver of life. You are not to eat the blood with the animal. It's supposed to be killed and bled properly. That's the idea behind kosher. A kosher, uh, kosher meat is an animal that's been killed in the proper way and bled thoroughly. And then a rabbi comes in and blesses the meat. And that's kosher. Because Orthodox Jews will not eat anything that hasn't been bled properly. But here we see back then God's people so driven by hunger because you had a goofball king who thought he was being spiritual. Don't eat anything today until I avenge myself on my enemies. Stay home. Okay? You know, we, we were doing fine without you, King Saul. Okay? Just... Whenever God starts to work, you have all these people running to help. You know, a lot of them are totally clueless. They start imposing all these legalistic rules on the work of God, kill the whole deal. I've seen it. I've seen it. But God's people back then, driven by hunger, were, were just they, they just began to eat defiled food, just like today. If you go into any Christian bookstore today, you will find a lot of defiled spiritual food, quote-unquote, that Christians are devouring like crazy. Before I came here this morning, I, dev I devoured. I googled. <laughs> and, uh, maybe I'm hungry. I don't know. <laughs> I googled. Top selling Christian books. You know what the first one was? Sarah's Young, Jesus Calling. Now, if you weren't here last week, or a week before, we had Warren Smith come out who was an ex-New Ager, Christian apologist, author, who wrote a book to counter that book called Another Jesus Calling. Sarah Young's book has been out for 10 years. It sold, listen, 12 million copies. 12 million copies. Christians are devouring it like crazy because they don't know any better. They're not being taught. There's no discernment. Oh, but wait a minute. You're putting down that book. It blessed me. It really helped me get through a rough patch. Look, you think the devil's going to deceive you with all evil things? Bad things, evil, hurtful things? He's going to mix in a lot of positive stuff, a lot of devotional thoughts that are going to uplift you on that day. But if you study carefully the Jesus of Jesus calling, and here's the deal. Sarah Young was greatly influenced by a couple of gals who wrote a book in the 1930s called God Calling. And what they did was, they just sat together in silence with a pad of paper and a pencil. And they said, okay, God, start talking. Now, I don't know if they were really believers, but the God who talked to them was not the God of the Bible. I challenge you to, well, I don't want you to read the book. Read a, re a review of the book. And you will find this God saying all kinds of things that were unscriptural, things God would never say. Well, Sarah was blessed by that book. And she decided if God could do it for them, he could do it for me. So she took a piece of paper and a pencil and sat and said, Okay, God, you know, Jesus, start talking to me. And a spirit that she believed was Jesus began to give her all kinds of dictation. In fact, it's called auto-dictation or spiritual dictation. You just open your mind up to the spirit realm and let the spirits begin to speak to you. She believed Jesus was talking to her. And I've read Warren's book, Another Jesus Calling, where he cites passage after passage and shows how it's unscriptural. Jesus would never say something like this, or it goes against what God has already said. The Jesus of Jesus Calling is not our Jesus. Yet Christians are devouring that book like crazy. Why? Because they're not being fed good, wholesome food from God's Word. Well, of course... 
that book was followed by other books, many of them from the Positive Confession Movement, How to Be Rich, How to Speak Your Wealth, Your Success, or those from the Positive Mental Attitude Group, you know, the people like the Joel Osteens and all that. It's not, that they, it's not what they say is wrong, it's what they don't say. It's what they leave out. It's all positive, warm and fuzzy stuff. They never talk about judgment or hell or sin or whatever. Then another one was John Edwards' book, uh, Practical Praying. John Edwards is a medium. And he, is, he has these seances and these sessions where he will uh, help people to speak to dead loved ones. You know who's in that book? Roma Downey. You know, touched by an angel. Her and her husband worked on that uh, Bible series and so on. She's a Catholic New Ager. She prays the rosary every day. Uh, John included her in his book. Guys, we are living in very deceptive times. And you should have seen the reviews after church, after first service, a gal came up, showed me the Amazon reviews on that particular book. They were glowing. All sorts of Christians who they think they're Christians. I don't know if they all are. So, oh, you have to read the book. It's wonderful. They teach you how to pray the rosary and all those kind of neat things and prayer and, you know. Are you kidding? There's so many things that are going on today, guys. Um, I don't even have time to get into all of them. A, a book that's been a bestseller for many years, uh, Celebration of Discipline by Richard Foster. He says the most important chapter in the book is the one that teaches you how to, visual, how to uh, contact the Lord through spiritual formation where you basically empty your mind of all thought by using a mantra or a, or a Christian phrase. I mean, yeah, the occult... They've done this for many centuries. But see, we're using Jesus or saying Abba. See, we're, we've Christianized it by, by repeating Christian mantras. You kidding me? In the Bible, we see meditation all over the place. God told Joshua, meditate on my word day and night. Then you will have strength to have victory and good success. But when the Bible uses the word meditation, it simply is a word that means to chew the cud. <laughs> It's a word that means to chew on God's word. Think on it. Extract from it every blessing God has put there for you to learn from. It's not Eastern meditation, which is to get somewhere and um, say a word over and over again or a phrase like a mantra until you empty your mind of all thought and you come into this, uh, this place called the silence where you're now connected to the spirit realm. And they're teaching Christians this is a wonderful new prayer technique, even though it's occultic. I mean, you have all kinds of things being promoted today that are, well, as John said, Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Paul said, the Spirit of God expressly says, in the last days, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and embrace doctrines of demons. We're seeing it today in the Church of Jesus Christ. And once again, guys, I blame pastors for not feeding their people faithfully on God's Word, which has made them so hungry for spiritual truth, they're devouring defiled spiritual food, which is poisoning them with last day's deceptions. Look, your Bible should be your main source of spiritual food. But after you read your Bible, it's not wrong to supplement it with other good Christian books. You want to read some good books that will bless your walk with God? How about books by A.W. Tozer, Andrew Murray, Alan Redpath, Leonard Ravenhill, Amy Carmichael, Elizabeth Elliot, just to name a few. I challenge you to go to your local Christian bookstore if you can still find one. Mine closed down. And go into their bargain bin. It's usually a garbage can that they've lined with uh, plastic and they throw all the books in there that nobody wants. Fish through there. They're usually a couple bucks. You'll find Christian classics. Books that nobody else wants. They want the hottest sellers now to teach them how they can be rich or how they can contact God like nobody else, how they can have experiences with the Holy Spirit and so on. This is what we're seeing the church feeding on today. Look, guys, we're done. When we're talking about victory over the devil, 
God gives the victory. He doesn't need our help. I'm not saying we do nothing. I'm not saying we don't go to church. We don't read our Bibles. I'm just saying, God doesn't need our help to give, him, give us the victory. Here's what we need to do. We need to trust in the power of the Holy Spirit every day. Because it's His power that gets us victory over the devil. Secondly, you need to be in prayer every day to get your marching orders from the Lord. Lord, is there anybody today you want me to talk to? Is there anybody you're going to bring across my path today? Make me sensitive to that so I can be ready to share with them if, if that's what you're going to do. Read your Bible. Feed on your Bible daily and obey it faithfully. Then and only then will you be a good soldier of Jesus Christ fit for the Master's use. And when he begins to use you, because guess what? We're in the last days. The work is great. The laborers are few. We need as many soldiers as we can get to enter into the battle with us. And when God begins to use you to fight his battles, and he gives you victory over the devil in whatever that means in your life, you make sure you give him the glory. Don't you dare take credit for what he's done. He'll put you on a shelf so fast and turn to somebody else to use. And when somebody asks you what is going on in your life, you're like a dynamo. I mean, you're like on fire. What is happening? What has caused you to get this way? You will say, all glory belongs to God. Great things he has done. I take no credit. I just said, Lord, here am I. Use me. I want to be used to, to tear down the strongholds of the devil and people's lives that I love and know. Will you use me? And God has begun to put his spirit upon me. I just took a venture in faith, like Jonathan. And God began to give victory. And when he does, don't try to add to it. Don't try to say, well, God, that's great. Let me help you out. No. Just say, to God be the glory, great things he has done. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that it's so subtle and we're so prone to it. But when you are moving in a, our life or in, in our church, so often we're prone to want to run over there and try to help you out. And that's the quickest way to squash what the Spirit is doing. Just give us grace to be open, to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading, that we can be where you're working, not to take credit for it, but, Lord, simply to be an instrument that you might use to bring it about. Lord, we want to be used in these last days. We want to take ventures in faith. We want to see the devil beaten back and, 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 and put to flight. Give us grace, Lord, that we might be a church that is on fire, a church that is, Lord, walking in the power of your Spirit. Lord, we need revival. Give us revival in this church, Lord. No, we're not dead like some churches, but we're not as alive as we want to be. Lord, revive us. Fill us with your Spirit. Give us an excitement to go out into this world and be a light. Father, we thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.